from Microbe TV. This is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 148, recorded on March 6th, 2018. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And remotely, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. And hello, Daniel. <laughs> and it is currently, do you want to know where the temperature is? It's about it's four degrees, and it's going to start snowing. Right. And Daniel called it a snowpocalypse. That's right. Yes. Or he said we someone having called a it a snowpocalypse. Snow I'm taking credit now. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, it's going to be like three or four inches. So in it's my it? world, that's you know not what? really a snowpocalypse. Well, Looking here they're the, saying 12 inches. Turn right? around, Vincent. Take a look out the window. It's what do you gorgeous. see? It's gorgeous. It's fabulous. There's a wonderful sun, sunset. sunset. And it's, it's probably Daniel. It's you can calm. see. It. Well, you don't have a window, right, where you are. No, I don't have a window. But well, hopefully I'm hoping to get like a quick run in before the uh, – the, the zombies and the snowpocalypse and you sure. know, the wolves come out of the walls. Yeah, the, the, he runs. How about that? <laughs> Where do you More run, Daniel? You. Do you run on outside or on a machine? You know, when I can, I much more um, prefer running outside. Fortunately, where I live in the north part of um, Long Island, there's a path that allows you to run along the water. Oh, that's it's cool. Just Oh, it's just great. Dixon, you're looking out. You're seeing the water. Dixon, you should run. I used to. What happened? Um, I got old. Life got in the way, huh? There, Life got in the way. There are That's people your age it. who run still. Yeah, but not many. <laughs> no? Not many. Now, when you get to be my age, certain things happen, like your joints start to uh, mm. feel the pain because the cartilage starts to lose its water, right? And the bone gets closer together. And the other thing that you do is you start to lose your balance. You my, fall, yeah. my biology teacher, Dominic Casuli, who is my all-time hero of – science because that's what got me into this to begin with inspirational guy i began by having lunch with him maybe two years ago and he was in his low 80s and he was running still and i saw him at a recent class reunion and he says you know i stopped running because i lost my balance and i was afraid of falling hmm. and i understand where that comes from i do so enjoy it while you can daniel all right. Well, listen, guys, we have a follow-up from last time. Uh, this is pretty interesting. Anthony writes, he sends us a link to an article. Oh, this is so great in pediatrics. The title is Visceral Larva Migrants Associated with Earthworm Ingestion. Hey. Clinical Evolution in an Adolescent Patient. This is a 16-year-old girl, developed cough, hypereosinophilia, hypergammaglobulinemia, and multiple non-cavitary pulmonary nodules one month after have ingestion an earthworm on a dare. Look, ooh. Toxocara species. There you was, go. Was confirmed. Visceral larva migrants. Are we surprised? No. No. You know, there, there have been several not. cases like this, actually. <laughs> really? So, yeah, it's sort of funny. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever ate earthworms on dares. No. But, uh, nope. <laughs> Never had the urge. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't eat them uncooked. You know, if you're going to go for it, say, I'm happy to do that, but may I cook it, please? Right. <laughs> so Anthony writes, after Dr. De Pommier mentioned earthworms as a mechanical vector of Bayless Ascaris, I looked to see if I could find more on Google. I didn't come across anything specific, but I did find this report. Yep. So it would seem likely that earthworms could carry the embryonated eggs not only to rodents, but also to insectivores and to birds eating worms. There you go. These might not be attracted to the partially digested grain in the raccoon latrines. Earthworms could not be not only increasing the physical space infected by by Bailey Ascaris, but also Bayless Ascaris, but also the species space of hosts. Right. Fascinating. Yep. Isn't it? It is. It was a case study. It was very funny. Yep. Not funny. Very good. Very yeah, well done. No, no. Yeah, there was a case. It was not too many years ago. It was actually in the local area where there were a, a few teenagers who uh, collectively dared each other to eat the worms. So. 
it's very <laughs> entertaining. What's the likelihood that this would happen if you ate an earthworm? Like what? One in ten? One in a hundred? One in a thousand? You know, it's pretty rare, to be honest. Um, so much so that they would use it as a case report. But mm-hmm. um, you know, I'm I'm trying to think of the words of the song that goes. Uh, Dun, 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 dun. Nobody loves me. I'm going to go and eat worms. Never heard of it. <laughs> Big ones, fat ones, little ones, short right. ones. I'm going to go and eat worms. On to our case from TWIP 147. <laughs> you don't like my singing, no. Vincent? No, no, no. <laughs> I, You're not I, alone. And I've also heard your trombone playing. And You're not alone. not so good either. Hey, wait a minute. You need minute. to practice. I resemble that remark. Daniel, what do we have for our case? <laughs> oh, I was going to, before I <laughs> everybody, I was going to say a lot of the risk would have to do with where you were eating your worms. Correct. Uh, and so, for instance, in New York City, interesting enough, so places where you have a lot of um, animals, dogs, particularly in this um, specific case, your risk is going to go up. You get in an area where, you know, let's say you don't own a dog, it's your backyard, it's fenced, it's low risk. So, again, those children that, you know, maybe are going to be eating some worms on dares in the future. Um, try to eat them in a place where there are no um, canis around. Right. And I'll reduce your risk. And just cook them. Okay. Cook those worms. <laughs> Remember that, everybody. Cook those worms. That's another one of my things. I've got a list of sayings that will be on my gravestone. <laughs> Daniel. <I see laughs> Should have cooked his worms. I see you have a twip. You have a twip hoodie, Daniel. I Yes, I am wearing my twip uh, hoodie. I've Thanks. got my twip paraphernalia on. That's a nice uh, nurse cell, Dixon. Is like that your nurse, nurse cell? I don't know. All right. <laughs> I think it is. My, it's, it Daniel, was, okay. I remind us yes. about TWIP 147 case. Yes. For those of you clicking in for the first time or those of you um, clicking again, double clicking, um, this is a case of a, we said a young child, um, about three years old. And this case was seen down in an area of South America. Uh, tropical region of South America. He was brought in by his mother, and the mother was reporting that the child, she says, has been sick for about a month. Uh, Prior to this, he'd been healthy. She reports that he has four siblings who all are healthy. Uh, She says his vaccinations are up to date, um, and her big concern is that he has abdominal pain. Uh, She says that the belly pain increases throughout the day, Uh, doesn't have a good appetite. She reports that uh, he's constipated and she reports these goat pellets, goat stools, that his stool actually looks like little pellets like that, which uh, she sees from the goats. She reports that he has fever, he seems swollen, his face is pale, his urine is dark, and his belly is distended when we see him. He does occasionally cough. We get a little information about his living conditions. We hear that his home has a dirt floor, and um, he spends much of the day scooting about on the dirt floor. On exam, he is, uh, is, as we mentioned, febrile. He doesn't look well. He has no teeth. I'll sort of be of note, he's a three-year-old. He's sleepy. He's not, not that responsive. He does have a distended belly. He is pale. He weighs only um, 13 kilograms. That puts him about 30 pounds. I'll translate that. Um, diffuse, scaly skin inflammation, um, really on the whole perianal buttock area. He has some breakdown of skin around the mouth. Um, he um, is HIV negative, HTLV1 negative. Uh, We understand that there are dogs, chickens, goats, lots of animals, lots of livestock coming and going in and out of the house. And we left you with the fact that a stool, ova and parasites had been sent. And when we got the results of this, there was a a diagnostic um, finding. All right. Okay. Here we go. Case, and I'm sorry. Hetty writes, three-year-old boy, tropical South America, stool O&P, contains something that gave diagnosis. My diagnosis is ascariasis. 30 years ago, my boyfriend at that time did part of of his internship in Brazil where he investigated children's stools. The mothers would bring him their children's stools in exchange for anti-helminthics. He looked for eggs with the microscope. After treatment, the mums brought him the worms that came out too and got the second dose. He did this in three environments, rich, middle, and poor. He did measure the number of worms, plus some characteristics of the children, weight, skin thickness, etc. <laughs> he kept sending me real long letters with photos of piles <laughs> of yellow, brownish worms. 
You said he was your boyfriend. Good old times. <laughs> Hetty is a public health doctor in the Netherlands. Nice. Cool, Hetty. Nice. What a great story. Yep. Did you save those photos of piles of yellow brownish <laughs> worms? Good old times. Dixon. Wow. Okay. Oh, this is a long one. Can you handle this? Try. try. Peter writes, a charade, however, a shared, shared. A shared twip. Daniel was wondering about people in Ireland speaking Irish versus Gaelic. To me, they both, um, they're both the same thing. In Ireland, we call our language Irish or Gaelic if speaking Irish. And outside Ireland, people tend to call it Gaelic. Some might say Gaelic is more associated with Scotland, but just as you say Scots Gaelic, you can also say Irish Gaelic. To bring it back to parasitology, the Irish potato famine would have been one of the factors in the demise of the Irish language, with a disproportionate amount of Irish speakers living in poverty at the time, resulting in the higher death rates and immigration amongst them. Fian Omarg in our department, who works on evolutionary divergence, is also a great advocate for the Irish language. I asked him about the Irish revival Daniel encountered last summer. He told me it's true. In Dublin in particular, there have been many new movements, such as Pop Up Galtk, where people meet to speak Irish in pubs, and the Twitter, that must be interesting after the third or fourth drink, and the uh, Twitter account uh, at uh, their Irish for is becoming very popular. So the language is being used by new people in new ways. Unfortunately, there has been a decline in the Irish speakers in traditional Irish-speaking areas. Galtics, Fionn pointed me towards quite a good piece in the Irish Times discussing this. Fionn Reach recently also wrote a great blog on Irish animal names and linguistic relativity, the relationship between language a person speaks and the way that a person thinks and the views and views the world. And then he uh, lists a website for that. My favorite, the Irish for jellyfish, translates <laughs> as seal snot. <laughs> I <laughs> like I, that. I, repeat? I, I will repeat that because <laughs> I, I like it too. Seal snot. <clears throat> Again, to bring it back to parasitology, but you don't give me the Gaelic equivalent. To bring it back to parasitology, if you tweeted on Valentine's Day that the Irish word Galen means sweetheart or alternatively a parasite, <laughs> literal meaning little relative. I think that tells you a lot about the Irish mind. <laughs> On to the case study. <clears throat> As with the last episode, I asked for help, and this is all the parasitology postgrad rallied to my call. So as so as well as Gwen and Maureen mentioned in my last email, I was joined by Rachel Byrne and Paula Tierney. Rachel currently works on the parasites of the Eurasian badger, an important study due to the Badger's Association with Bovine TB, with little known of their parasites, let alone how they may interact with TB infections or the planned badger TB vaccination. Paula and Dixon could probably spend a good afternoon picking each other's brains on a riverbank, given Paula currently works on helminth parasite communities of common days and she gives the species name for that, an invasive freshwater fish in Ireland, and brown trout, Salmo trotta, mm, an economically important native sympatric species. The case study symptoms were not as obvious to us as the Leishmania case, and the dirt floor allowing everybody to suggest their favorite parasite as a candidate, Ascaris or hookworm maybe. To narrow it down, we searched parasitic diseases for constipation, which we thought an unusual symptom as parasite Parasitic diseases are normally more associated with diarrhea. Constipation was only associated with Chagas disease and stridulodiasis. As the fecal examination was key, as opposed to a blood test, we ruled out Chagas. We first thought it was Strongylodes fulliborni due to swollen belly syndrome, but then realized it was limited to Papua New Guinea and Sub-Saharan Africa. This left our diagnosis as Strongyloides stercoralis, with infection coming from the soil, possibly contaminated by visiting animals, most likely the dogs, or possibly asymptomatic family members. The abdominal distension, distension with a, is a syndrome that can be developed with S. stercoralis in children, <clears throat> as is the anorexia and cachexia observed. We found the increase in pain throughout the day interesting, but believe this may be due to pain when eating. The child is malnourished, which appears to have led to hyperinfection. This could explain the toxic appearance of the child and secondary infection with microorganisms making him febrile. 
We thought the anal rash could have been as a result of the worms entering when the child was sitting rather than through the foot. But reading uh, another uh, reference, it, it stated, <coughs> recurrent rashes are known as larva currens or creeping infection. It occurs from strongyloides autoinfection and appears to be an eruption beginning in the perianal region. Autoinfection also would uh, explain the coughing. The breakdown of skin around the mouth and the dark urine threw me off a bit, and I thought perhaps there was a co-infecting parasite. Some searching suggested uh, dark urine is not only caused by blood in the urine, <clears throat> which was my first thought, but also dehydration, which also explains the breakdown around the mouth. Some reading of the literature revealed dehydration associated with some de severe cases of strangulitiasis. So yes, it seems to be strangulitis fulborne, Diagnosed by examination of a much by as much stool as possible using sedimentation. Further testing using ELISA due to the, to the evidence of hyperinfection. Prolonged treatment with ivermectin and albendazole. Supportive therapy if in hyperinfection confirmed, as well as treatment to treat dehydration and malnourishment. Very sad case, but helps highlight the great <clears throat> and I am sure too often unacknowledged work Dr. Griffin and colleagues carry out. Thank you. I'm conscious that this already is a long email. And last week, you got 15 case studies of emails. No, you got 15 case study emails. But listening to you talk about Theodore Billhart's, I thought you would enjoy this story. In 2002, I watched a surfing documentary about some of the first American surfers to travel the world in search of the perfect wave. I believe it was in Africa, where they used to travel by commercial riverboat and then paddle on their surfboards downriver to find the shore and hopefully some sweetbreads. Sweet breaks. <laughs> Sweet breaks. Right. Sorry. Sweet breaks. Just as Daniel said, the local people are well informed and used to shout Bill Hartzia, Bill Hartzia at them <laughs> in warnings as they paddled past. This laid by these laid back surfers just thought, cool. Some guy thought Bill Harzi must have surfed here before and kept on paddling. As far as I recall, none of them got infected, mm. though. Finally, <laughs> it being Twip, I have to mention the beast from the east. The forecasted weather due to hit Ireland with one of the coldest weeks in three decades. So he signs off and says, Peter Stewart uh, from Trinity College, Dublin. P.S. Rachel, being very good at science communication, uh, suggested I add our group's Twitter handle to my signature. She's right. She's uh, And he lists at TCDP Parasitology. <sighs> I know. You, you made it, Dixon. <laughs> you survived. But barely. I was worried about you. Why well, worry about me, too? Bill Harzia. Bill Harzia. <laughs> That's great. Bill I Harzia. voted for him last year. He's my favorite politician. <laughs> Daniel. All right. So we have a Oscarus and a str Stranger Ladies, right? Stranger. <laughs> stranger Ladies. That's exactly right. Is that bad to say Stranger Ladies? Is that derogatory uh, I, in any way? Will no, I offend it's, anyone? It's a stupid way of remembering the name of this thing. Is it okay? Yeah, we sure. could use it for a title. That's fine. Daniel. Well, if it's right. Uh, <laughs> Arthur writes, hello, Twipanosome Trio. My name is Arthur, and I am an undergrad student in Connecticut studying infectious diseases and how they influence our species evolution and culture. I found Twip through a recent mention on NPR and love it as well Look as the whole that. brand of this week in blank. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's referring to the Twix universe. Yeah, that that was actually fun. I, I don't think we mentioned it yeah, the last it time, but yeah, I was driving my son to uh, soccer. And I think, Dixon, where were you? You were driving with your wife somewhere. And we were yeah, I was listening pretending to I was an Uber driver for my wife while she shopped for yarn at a, at a yarn store. Uh, and uh, <laughs> on there, there's one of those shows on NPR, and I guess it's thinking, when does my son do soccer? Saturday. It's so called Saturday afternoon. Ask me another. And, uh, yeah, one of the questions, you know, they have these, you know, tell me if the following podcasts really exist. And uh, the the question was, this week in parasitism. True and false, right? <laughs> they said, that couldn't possibly be right. And then, of course, it was not just true. Daniel, tell them what the host said. <laughs> I think, well, the host, of course, said, well, I think it's infectious. But we, you know, I was told that they got the parasol, the, the line, the tagline wrong. It should have been, it's parasitic. <laughs> that way, That's true. That's true. That meant they hadn't listened to it. He said he would listen to it, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it was a she. That, was it she? Yeah, she is the host. I want to see if we got a bump? Yeah, I would love to see that. Well, while we Daniel is reading, I will, uh -huh. I will look at the, the stats. 
Uh, Great. Let me go ahead and read. Uh, yeah, maybe we could even put a link to them. So, uh, oh, I would think we should do that. Anyway. Oh, they're private. Oh, they are. So we can't link to them. We can't say go listen to them. No, no you can't anyway, see the link. Anyway, you, what listen, do you mean? Oh, to the show. Yeah, yeah the show. To the we show you can do. do that. You can actually get the section of the show that actually has that transcript. Mm. I listened to it several times. <laughs> okay. That yeah, was fun. A lot of fun. Yeah. Let me go ahead. I am emailing you as a layman, <laughs> but I have a guest for the case study at episode 147 of a three-year-old with perianal skin inflammation, distended belly, pellet-like stool, and low weight. My guess, which is likely wrong given the odds, <laughs> is a rare symptomatic infection of dipolidium caninum, the flea tapeworm. Diagnosis of this would be through identifying proglottids in the feces. There are two reasons I can think of that the older children are not symptomatic. Firstly, older children tend to behave differently around dogs and are unlikely to ingest a flea, the requirement for transmitting the disease. Or they are simply larger, require a higher dose of parasites to become symptomatic. Either way, I worry I am likely wrong because the total amount of recorded symptomatic cases is somewhere in the low dozens, though that doesn't discourage me from hazarding this guest. Thank you very much for the podcast that occupy my nearly hour-long commute, Arthur. P.S. Do any of you have recommended reading that covers the parallel evolution of parasites and humans or that might detail changes in cultures on account of specific diseases? Thank you again. Wow. There's a lots of literature that address these issues, but not specifically as a title of a book or things like this. It's in other books related to, let's say, forced human migration due to trypanosomiasis in Africa and forced to living in places where they really don't want to live. But uh, since they can't live where the trypanosomes live, they live somewhere else. And uh, there is a lot of cultural rearrangements due to uh, – Parasitic infections, like in West Africa during onchocerciasis, during the heyday, people deserted entire villages and cities almost to get away from this uh, terrible disease. And uh, now that ivermectin has been used successfully, they all moved back. So interesting. Yeah, I was just made me sort of think of maybe some of the Jared Diamond work, yep. but I think that's broader than just parasites, right? That's yeah, going right. to deal with a lot of viruses, a exactly. lot of bacteria, as well as, you know, parasitic. And um, it, it's such a broad topic if you think about um, any book about malaria, which has had a huge impact on human beings. Yeah, that's true. Just <clears throat> Absolutely right. Well, we didn't get a bump from NPR, but we did <laughs> recently pass 1.5 million downloads all time, which is not bad for a little obscure <laughs> podcast uh, on stuff that's very hard to understand, right? Um, 1.5 mil is pretty good, I think. We should be proud of that. Oh, very proud. Very proud. I'm happy that you, Thank you, you joined me in this proud endeavor. <laughs> Absolutely right. Andrew writes... Wow, this is... And writes, cool. and writes. <laughs> uh, hello, Twipologists. <clears throat> I submitted an answer a few cases ago, but I was late submitting, so ended up re getting read the next time. So I'm not let, going to let that happen again. I wanted to submit an answer to Twip 147. Hope we win one of your fantastic signed books. This one's about <laughs> the three-year-old boy. As I said in my last response, I'm the guy who sits at the microscope and diagnoses these organisms every day for physicians. Think a much younger Dixon de Pommier. <laughs> at first, I immediately thought of schistosomiasis, Mansoni, his cough, abdominal pain, and febrile presentation. Could be Kadayama fever. This would also cover the suggestion of hepatobiliary involvement. But uh, as for the scaly skin around the perianal area and breakdown of skin around the mouth, I thought maybe he was sitting in a pond while also drinking dirty water. But my medical director pointed out to me that schistosoma mansoni is usually found in the venules of the large intestine, not the small intestine, and that the scaly rashes could be sequelae of malnutrition. I think it would be important to ask his mother if he has had any exposure to contaminated water with snails lately. I don't think this is, though. No mention of water. He seems too sick and seems more like one of my other two options. He'd also expect his siblings to be sick if it was from the water. Also at the top of our differential list are Ascaris, Lumbricoides, and Hookworm. Some longer shots that don't seem to fit are Strongyloides, Stercoralis, Trichiurus, Trichiura, Intestinal Kepilariasis, Toxocara, and Hymenolepsis nana. Hookworm is an option as a dirt floor would be the perfect way to obtain it through the skin. Patient's location would fit. Hookworm has a lung phase. Uh, high enough numbers of organisms cause a distended abdomen. 
but that could also be malnourishment. Um, the rash associated with hookworm is usually at the site of penetration or it can spread due to cutaneous larva migraines. It is very itchy, but it appears this was not itchy. There was no mention of spreading. I have read some sources that say the rear portions of the lesions can be dry and crusty, but I would still suspect an itchiness. I would ask the mother if she had noticed him itching. I understand the boy is three, so it may be hard to tell. However, in your book, there are a few nods toward the association of hookworms and dogs, which we know were present. Ancelostoma brasiliensis is associated with cutaneous larva migraines and the host is dogs, but this doesn't seem like cutaneous mig- migraines to me. And A. brasiliensis doesn't have a systemic phase. My guess here would be Nicator americanus, not Ancelostoma. Ascaris lumbricoides is our other guess. South America is a common place for this helminth as well, and like the hookworm, Ascaris ova will be ingested. After ingesting, they hatch in the small intestine, migrate through the bloodstream to the lungs. They travel through the lungs. They cause some coughing. Your book also states that Ascaris can produce an allergic response. After spending six to ten days in the lungs, go to the throat where they're coughed up, swallowed to auto-infect. The distended abdomen, abdominal pain, constipation, malnutrition all add up to Ascaris. Um... The source is soil borne through hand-to-mouth contact, which would make sense for a three-year-old. The only thing that stops me from pulling the trigger is the scaly rash. However, as my medical director said, it could be a sequelae from malnutrition. Also, possibly he has a co-infection of Ascaris and Trichuris, as these two are commonly found together in infected patients, and he seems too sick for it just to be a whipworm. If I were somehow granted a medical degree and given rights to see this patient, these three <laughs> would be on my first Three on my differential list. The two that are tied for number one are hookworm and ascariasis, with or without trichorus. Given what we know, I would lean toward hookworm since there are dogs around. He is so malnourished. I would prefer to rely on the stool O and P for definitive diagnosis. I would give the boy albendazole in the meantime while the results are pending from the lab, but I bet this was hookworm. Decatur americanus. In an OMP, if the diagnosis is ascaris, I would expect to see mammillated ovoid eggs that are usually brown from being stained with bile. They measure about 50 to 7 microns long under the wet prep or iodine prep exam. Ascaris eggs are very distinguishable from most other helmets. It's not uncommon to see adult ascaris worms in the stool toilet. Ascaris is known as the giant roundworm, and that is because adults, usually females, can grow up to a foot long, and typically the patient, especially if the abdomen is distended, is infected with many, many, many worms, and yes, they are usually alive and moving. I had an adult ascaris worm submitted that was still moving when I was a student at my clinical internship, and it was about eight or nine inches long. They make a really cool show and tell when we have lab visitors. Mm. If the diagnosis were hookworm, however, I would expect to see eggs that are ovoid with a clear shell and dark embryo on a wet prep or iodine prep. Hookworm eggs typically measure 60 to 75 microns, pretty distinguishable from other helminth ova. They appear a lot cleaner than Ascaris ova on microscopic exam. You would not see a larvae or adults in the stool unless the sample was old and the eggs had hatched. So that's my answer. But I have one question I was wondering about with this case that maybe you have answered already. You said the belly pain increases throughout the day. Can you tell me what's causing that? Sorry, this is so long. A lot to consider here. Thanks for your fantastic podcast. Andrew is at MLSASCP. P.S. There was some discussion last time regarding the letters after my name. MLS stands for Medical Laboratory Scientist. You got that right. But... ASCP stands for the American Society for for Clinical Clinical Pathology, Pathology. not Parasitology, (laughs) although I love Parasitology and totally would get that certification if I could. (laughs) It means I am competent to work in all areas of a clinical lab, not just microbiology or Parasitology. Great. Thank you, Andrew. That's a young Dixon de Pommier. There you go. Sitting there churning out the diagnoses. I'll tell you something. If you were a doctor and you went to see that patient, you would still have to rely on that person in the laboratory for the definitive diagnosis because there's nothing specific about this that you could hang your hat on and say, oh, if I see that, that's always going to be this disease. That's not the case. Mm-hmm. This la- The laboratory diagnosis is everything. You're next, Dixon. Sure. Yeah. David writes, dear hosts, I believe the three-year-old South American boy has been infected with the soil-transmitted helminth, Strongyloides stercoralis. The floriform larvae residing in the contaminated dirt floor penetrated the boy's skin near his mouth and anus, which explains the breakdown and inflammation of skin in those regions. Those larvae, which migrate to the small intestine, have become adults, which result in the boy's abdominal symptoms, descended belly, aches, constipation. And the remaining symptoms, cough, fever, unresponsiveness, can be attributed to the dissemination of the worms throughout the boy's body, typically as stercoralis is prevalent 
and the immunocompromised, but given the poverty that the boy lives in, it is feasible. He is malnourished and has an underdeveloped immune system. Thank you once again for the informative and entertaining podcasts. Daniel. Patri- Patricio writes, Hi, my name is Patricio Rojas, and I live in Ecuador. I live in a, I work in a private university in Quito and teach an undergrad course of microbiology. Nice. I've been recently following TWIM and TWIP and I'm becoming a fan of these wonderful programs. My suspicion for case 147 is the geohelminth Ascaris lumbicoides, which can cause partial or complete gut obstruction, plus can migrate to the pancreatic and biliary ducts. The diagnosis is performed by the distinctive ova shed on stool in stools and occasionally by the presence of the worms. Other symptoms may arise uh, by the fact that the larval forms have to migrate to the lungs in order to maturate. Therefore, patients can present... Um, with cough uh, due to a pulmonary condition known as Loeffler's syndrome. Geohelminth infections are highly prevalent in developing countries, especially in rural and suburban areas. Living without clean water, in direct contact with dirt and mud, plus having pets and other domestic animals can increase the risk. Best regards, Patricio Rojas, MD, PhD, Professor, School of Medical Sciences, Universidad Tecnológico Equino Cosiel. Perfect pronunciation. You must be. Well, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded good well, to me. We had six guesses, and we had, let's see, that last one was Ascaris. Right. And then we had Stranger Ladies. Right. And then we had another Ascaris. Right. And well, actually, Andrew waffled between Ascaris and Hookworm. Yeah, and one of them gave us every parasite you could possibly imagine that could catch off a dirt. Then we had a, <laughs> the flea, the flea transmit, the flea tapeworm, right. uh, and and then we also had uh, Strongyloides again, and another Ascaris. So mostly Strongyloides or Ascaris, huh? Mostly. Okay, and there was something in the uh, stool. Right, Dixon? There was. Did that give it away to you? Not yet. <laughs> I want to see a picture. <laughs> well, what are the possibilities? <laughs> well, there's a lot of them. I mean, you could find eggs. You could find larvae. Uh-huh. You could find cysts. You could find trophozoites. You could find lots of things. So we have to wait for the diagnosis. A veritable cornucopia. A plethora <laughs> of parasitic possibilities. <laughs> right, Daniel. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think of these guesses, Daniel? Um, I, I think they're excellent, uh, and I will say, um, you know, with the strongyloides, we even got people got even a little more specific. They went into uh, the distinction between Stercoralis and uh, Fulaborni, right. which I think is interesting. Uh, let, let's go through a couple of the features that I thought were interesting that might help us. Um, one was, as we noticed, I think this is interesting. The the white count was elevated, so this individual had elevated white count. He's appearing rather sick. And his eosinophils are low. Right. I don't know if that made people think of anything. Um, the other, which I think is interesting, sometimes what people are thinking impacts what tests get ordered and what test results we have available. So the fact that we know that there's an HTLV1 that's negative might get people thinking of certain things, um, as well as the HIV negative. Um, I don't know. The the other interesting, and I think maybe Dixon had the benefit, maybe. I don't know. We'll have to see. But um, I, I showed a picture to Dixon of just the severity of this rash. Um, and it wasn't just perianal, but really the entire um, buttock area was involved with this scaly um, rash. Right. So when I when I throw those out there, does that does that help any more, Dixon, with sort of thoughts? It does, because when you say an elevated white cell count, I presume there's a shift to the left. So there's some um, immature neutrophils that are floating around because the body is trying to churn out uh, defense mechanism number two. Um, No eosinophils, which would fit very well with a superimposed bacterial infection on top of an infection like strongyloides, because that's basically the, the etiology of the thing as it progresses, as the larvae become auto infectious penetrate the large intestine after feeding a second stage larvae and now they're third stage larvae filled guts with bacteria that they then have to defecate and wherever they go in the body that's where they dump them so there's a micro injection of my of bacteria all of which you can find in the microbiome of the large intestine basically uh so 
one person gets a Klebsiella infection, another person gets a Pseudomonas infection, another person gets an E. coli infection, and they're all related to this um, mm. behavior of a hyperinfection due to uh, autoinfectious disease from strange lace. So I, I would, without seeing the slide that was going to give this away, of course, I would, I would throw my hat in the ring for a, a, a species of strangeloides and perhaps Fulaborni. Yeah. Fulaborni might fit the bill here. Mm. Yeah, I'll give a, I'll give a little bit more. And, you know, and at this point, um, you know, people have sort of, um, it's probably an expression that's escaping me, but they've already thrown in their guesses. Um, but one of the first things, um, before we actually get the ONP diagnosis back, is this boy, Esme, he looks sick. He looks, as we say, septic. And one of the things that we do um, in in most of the world, when possible, is we, we start broad-spectrum antibiotics. And, and the issue that there are certain parasites that will kill you, like malaria, um, but bacteria in general will often kill people with parasites rather quickly. So this boy received broad-spectrum antibiotics. And in much of the world, interesting enough, that's ceftriaxone. Huh. Um, when he received the ceftriaxone, was um, given rehydration and given a specific anti-helminth that we'll mention soon. <laughs> his eosin- he, he immediately improved and his eosinophil count rose to over 1,000. That's so, uh, very telling. Yeah, so I, I think that that. So at this point, you're you're ready to give your diagnosis, Dixon, you feel like before you even well, see the stool O and P? Yeah. If, I mean, if you tell me you didn't see any eggs, but you did see larvae, that would sort of <laughs> sway that, me into my <laughs> diagnosis. But but the fact that you got to switch from a shift to the left neutrophils back to the eosinophil granulocytic series is, is very telling because it means that this parasite, probably in the beginning of its life cycle, before it developed into a hyperinfection cycle, you did have an eosinophilia associated with this, and that disappeared as soon as the bacteremia went up. So I, I would I remember, I hope that that individual who said they were a little younger me, uh, I'm not a doctor either, but I've hung around doctors all my life, and I'm, I'm talking like one right now. But um, if you know anything about the hemopoietic system and the, the way the body makes a choice based on need, uh, eosinophils are thought to be a response to a well. We'll see in the next uh, in our reviewed paper uh, how that plays out. But they're not really an effector mechanism for most of these parasitic infections. There are a few where they are, but most of them they're just a response to an allergen of some sort that are given off by the parasites. Whereas neutrophils are killers, and those are going to come in and, and sweep up all those bacteria and try try to put the host back on its feet again. So I I, I think when you see that switch. And then you give the right drug, and it switches back to an eosinophilia. Um, yeah, I think there probably is an, like Dr. Griffin would say, there's about a 95 percent chance that this is an infection of some sort. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And and that that was actually what was larva were seen in ah, the stool. Well, then there was it a fresh. Yeah. Then you have to ask: Was the stool delivered directly to the laboratory within, let's mm-hmm. say, six hours? Because if it wasn't, and it sits around for a couple of days, and it was actually hookworm, they can develop in that length of time and develop into larvae. And then you'll see those larvae instead of Strongyloides larvae. You will see hookworm, and then you have to know how to tell those two worms apart. Yeah. So that's an interesting nuance, but I'm sure that. This was a fresh stool that was delivered, looked at, and bam, there they were. Over. Yeah, no, I mean, and that I think that brings up something you are mentioning, um, which I mentioned as well, is that um, a, a good connection, a good working relationship, um, and a reliable um, parasitology lab That's is right. um, is critical, invaluable. Know? And and even, you know, maybe you're getting it right, you know, Dixon threw out that 95% number. Um, you know, I tell my kids that means every 20th patient gets the wrong diagnosis. That's not <laughs> so great. Um, and you want you want the lab to be giving you feedback so you're constantly being corrected so you, you don't get that 5% wrong, which is unacceptable, I, I, I would say, in medicine. And um, so that, that was a right. nice thing in this case is that um, there was communication with the lab. The stool was sent. Actually, this was found out before the child even had a chance to improve because there was such a quick response. Sure. But it's in a case like this, it would be pretty hard, I would say, to, to miss um, the larvae because it's such a heavy burden. Right. Um, and this particular um, clinical syndrome that we're describing is, I think, is uh, you know, people talk about the rashes that are associated with um, strongyloides. And for some reason, I think that larva curans is the one that everyone remembers. Um, 
And I think it's unfortunate because there are several other rashes that we see. So one is this um, periumbilical thumbprint purpura, uh, which I think we may have had a case with that. And another is this, we are actually seeing the L3 larvae um, reinvade um, or invade through the buttocks, maybe through the mouth, and you get these horrible rashes, which then improve once you treat um, the strongyloides. Here, here. So I think we should sort of have uh, in our mind that there, there actually are several rashes associated with strongyloides, not just the larva yep. curants. So Daniel, you're the physician in charge of this case. What do you do next? Well, in this case, um, the the little boy was um, was given ceftriaxone. He was given ivermectin. He was rehydrated. Um, he was actually fed, um, as we mentioned, the eosinophils rose. And before we get too much into the um, treatment, which I do want to talk about, because I think we've actually, there's been some recent papers that are, I think, helping us more, is this interesting distinction between Stercoralis and Filiborne. Mm -hmm. So what do, we, you know, what do we think? Um, from a treatment point, I don't know if we need to know, right? We're going to treat them the same. Right. But from, a, um, from an interest point of view and even from an epidemiologist, um, you know, if you look at our book, we make the point that in general, Fulaborni is something that's described you know, sporadically at a few places um, in, uh, say, Southeast Asia as well as Africa, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, but um, <laughs> in the 90s, there actually were, um, I think the first case was 99, was described in South America. And, and, um, I can't because I'm not a clinical, you know, in the lab looking through the microscope certified parasitology lab person. Um, but someone who is can actually distinguish morphologically between Stercoralis and Filiborni. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as clinicians, you know, the fact that Strongyloides is helpful, but understanding this clinical um, presentation with the distended belly, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, which was sort of the classic description that was first given for the Filiborni infections. Uh, this this case sounds um, interesting as a potential uh, Filiborni presentation. Mm. I would agree. Wow. And you'd have to get strangely Stercorellus larvae next to them to actually see the difference. But uh, the differences are small, but um, relevant. And like you said, the, the treatment is the same. But what I wanted you to really go back to, and I'm sure you will, is what do you do about the rest of the people in the family, and how do you prevent this from happening again? Yeah. So we'll go a little bit, and, and this is what I'll say is that you know, this is a tough infection. Um, and one of the things that we've just recently learned, uh, you know, because I think there's more interest in this recently, is we used to have the idea that you would give, and we have these recommended, give this dose of ivermectin, and then that's great. But particularly in someone who's heavily infected, it can actually take more than just the one or two <laughs> doses. It can actually take a really long period of time. And what we're beginning to realize now is our treatment for strongyloides is not sterilizing. We're actually not completely clearing the infection. We're really getting on top of it. So in addition to treating this boy for more than just the two days, um, we're going to want to treat him and then we're going to want to follow um, the amount of larval forms in the stool over time. Um, the other is we want to improve his um, his overall health, right? Because there's the, the host aspect. And so if he's eating better, if he's no longer um, scooting around on this floor and getting the exposure through his skin, that's going to be helpful as well. Um, the other issue is that it's pretty hard to get this out of the environment. I think we've talked in the past about how um, – Strongyloides is a very interesting an organism. Is it has a free living cycle independent of us, so it doesn't even need us around. We could leave for a while, and it can go into this um, different free living cycle. No question. And it's a great swimmer. So you yeah. have mud and water; uh, they can actually penetrate the skin this way, and it's almost like catching schistosomiasis at that point. So you don't have to eat it in order to get it. You can just sit down, or you can just play in the water, play in the mud. Little kids love to do that, right? So the fact that his sibs were not infected is probably because they're, they're not lying. No, we don't know they're not infected. Well, we said they're healthy, at least. That doesn't anyway. mean they're not infected. Yeah, I understand that, sir. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I just wanted to raise that. Yeah, That's I understand, point, right? but <laughs> why are they healthy, then, if they're infected? Let's go see them. Yeah, no, that's... <laughs> Diagnose. No, I think... That, I want a stool uh, exam on everybody in that family. So the, if they don't lie on the floor and they just walk barefoot, they could get infected, Of course. Right? Okay. Of course. 
You yeah. know, I would say I would say Vincent. They are probably they're all infected. I would be surprised if they weren't. The and the, the issue mother, would, the mother as well, and the father. Yeah, yeah. Every, everyone, everybody is infected. Sure, everyone's infected, but not everyone's sick. Um, that's and that's one of the things I would say with strongoloides is that mm-hmm. in areas like this, there. I mean, at least with Fulaborni, right? They did some um, areas where Fulaborni was the major um, strongoloides. Hundred percent um, serological evidence of infection, mm-hmm. and so a lot of these places, but the issue is the age, the exposure, the inoculum, the health status. He's sitting there on the floor and basically probably, you know, having, you know, a little bit of feces coming out and then he's sitting in it, you know. And so he's constantly um, helping, assisting in this auto-infectious cycle Mm -hmm. where his older siblings, parents, you know, they're wearing pants and shoes and sitting not on the the dirt um, with the skin right there for infection. Um, so I think a lot of it is um, can be changes in exposure. Um, and do we do we check the you know do we go into these places? Do we try to treat everyone? Uh, that's often not sort of the control program. It's more of the non pharmacological. It's you know get the kids' nutrition up, get them off the floor, um, do what we can to prevent this auto infectious cycle from so, continuing. So if his if his family is all infected, right, and they're not symptomatic. Yeah. Are they going to be okay the rest of their lives? Or are they going to eventually get symptomatic? It depends. A lot of this depends. Well, they could get sick from something. Uh, for instance, we have numbers of cases in the literature of people who get uh, sick from something else that depresses their immune system and triggers a hyperinfection for strangeloides. They're particularly true for organ transplantation, but a, a, a case of diverticulosis will do the same thing, by the way. Hmm. So... I was going to ask Daniel what the drug of choice was for curing poverty. Yeah. Because that's the core issue yeah. here. I was going to say education, um, but it's a challenge. I mean, that that is the biggest thing that drives um, these problems is that, you know, here we live in a situation of plenty, yet there's an estimated more than 2 billion people who do not have reliable access to clean water, to clean, nutritious disease-free food. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it's a tough it's a tough situation. I mean, you can't wave uh, a magic wand and make all this go away, mm-hmm, and that's yeah. the problem. And uh, there's a lot of social injustice, and I'm, I'm sure this is one of those examples that, that we would all give lip service to, and it's ironic and uh, depressing to realize that when I first started to teach at Columbia, and even when I went there as a student, this was the issue, and it's still the issue. I mean, I'm I'm pretty old now, folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This should have been gone by now in many places, and it probably is, and it's probably a better world because of it, but you can still find a lot of this, too. And so it's it's very discouraging to see that uh, a lot of the world still lives the way it always did. So I will, I will also, I guess, more in your question, Vincent, will they eventually um, have problems? And um, I don't know if it's a case that we've presented yet, but we had a case not too long ago at um, Columbia where the story was the woman was originally from, I believe it was Columbia, but a country in South America. Yep. And she was up in um, New York City, and she developed a condition that prompted her physician to give her a 10-day course of prednisone. Uh, and that exactly. was that was enough to trigger things. Wow. Her admission was for a gram negative meningitis, mm. and then um, you know, fortunately, I think she was at Columbia, and someone um, put you know put the pieces together and mm. realized that what had happened was the steroids had um, triggered this acceleration of the auto infective cycle. The steroids not only decrease your immune system, but they accelerate the maturation from L2 exactly. to L3. So getting these infective while they're still inside of you. Yeah. And then when they come across, they're animals. They're they're full of feces. They defecate inside of us. Um, e. coli, gram-negative organisms from the intestines, they'll actually migrate and you can end up with these gram negative meningitis and not only do you need to treat the gram negative meningitis but you need to treat the strongoloides or this is just going to recur yeah the amazing thing about just now shifting to the <laughs> you know the immunologic aspects of this is to realize that the immune system does control the development of the worm the immune system actually places pressure on this worm not to develop the third stage larvae until they get outside the body and by reducing the immune system's um, attack on the swarm, whichever molecules they're looking at that, that results in that, the worm is now free to develop at its own rate, and, and, and they do so inside the body. So that if we could ever decide through research, of course, and through careful 
carefully looking at the uh, proteasome of, of uh, this worm as well as our immune system as to which molecules are being reacted to, you could come up with an approach to this that would prevent this from happening ever again if you could develop a nice preventative vaccine that uh, only allowed the worms to develop outside. Daniel, so you mentioned before that you're not you're not uh, sterilizing. Does, does no one ever get sterilizing treatment? That's- so that, that was a recent paper, which is interesting. We, we didn't know that. Um, but now that we have um, PCR technology, they actually did um, a nice study. It came out just in the last month or so where they looked at people that have been treated and then followed them down the road with PCR and everyone stayed PCR positive. Um, wow. So, yeah, which is I think that's sort of paradigm shifting. Which, wow. Mm-hmm. What do, what do you do then? Keep giving uh, ivermectin once a year like you do for onchocerciasis? Well, that, that's the thing that we sort of brought up before is that if you can keep the host healthy, um, yeah. you know, you, you do have to think about that. You think every time they have an immune issue, you don't think like, oh, you know, you're getting your transplant, but you got your two doses, two doses of ivermectin. We don't have to worry. Right. You got to keep in mind that you have not completely cured them. You've hopefully tipped the balance so that things are now going to be fine for a while and the inoculum will be low enough sort of below the trigger threshold. Um but yeah, you got to keep vigilant because you can't completely clear or appears, you know, at least based on the study that that isn't mm-hmm. the case. Mm-hmm. So what, uh, how did the young child end up? He actually did quite well. Um, you know, I, I, we felt he probably had a secondary bacterial infection. So he was treated with the ceftriaxone. He got the ivermectin um, and he actually did quite well. So that right. was it's sort of nice to see. Good. Um, and you do you tell the mother to try and keep the child off the mud floor or do you do any behavioral recommendations or no Dixon's we, rolling his uh, eyes <laughs> no no we we, we did we tried to tell um, a three-year-old you know, kid anything <laughs> we we did but you know it was actually you know it was tough because again it was the whole context the mother was struggling right i mean she yeah, yeah. really needed to get back to her four other kids so yeah. even just the idea that we needed to keep the child in the hospital for a while was met with some resistance um yeah it's a, it's a challenge when resources are limited like this all right well two people got that right, right? yeah i think before we do our random number i just <laughs> thought just for a um a uh, review the life cycle do you want to do that dixon just because we always like to say sure right. so <laughs> who could resist <laughs> <laughs> Well, the way you catch this infection is either by being penetrated by a third stage larva from from feces that you've uh, stepped on or the result of feces that was there and now it's gone, but the larvae are still there. Or you can actually get penetrated through the skin if you swim in an area that's contaminated with human feces that has the uh, larvae in it to begin with. So, But it, in either case, it penetrates the skin. The larva then goes into the bloodstream. It goes through the lungs. Um, and the liver, of course, and then eventually is is coughed up, and then it uh, swallowed, goes down to the small intestine. The fee- the worm. Now you can only, even if you only had one worm, this will still result in a full blown infection. <clears throat> the worm then penetrates a row of columnar cells in the small intestine, and transforms into the adult stage eventually. And then we have this controversial life cycle uh, glitch where the female worm starts off as a male and then stores the sperm, develops female organs, self-fertilizes, <clears throat> and the larvae are then produced live. This worm gives birth to live larvae, and they are deposited within the crypts of the uh, small intestine. They then burst out of the small intestine as second-stage larvae and continue as second-stage larvae until they're, they exit the host, provided there's no immunosuppression. Uh, at which point they then fall into the ground. And as Daniel alluded to before, they can go through a number of cycles of reproduction, with heads, which has nothing to do with the host whatsoever. They develop into this remarkable uh, free-living uh, kind of a worm, which almost looks like a Cenorhabditis elegans or something like that. And until they run out of nutrients, they remain in that mode. And then as the nutrients uh, are reduced and they can reproduce no longer, many of the worms that develop to third stage just stay that way, just like hookworm would stay that way. And they wait for a host to come along. And and usually a host does come along. And this worm can also infect other animals, primates of all kinds, uh, canids of all kinds, and uh, and also uh, felines of all kinds. So we have lots of reservoir hosts to worry about as well. And that's a complicating factor in trying to get rid of this thing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. 
So that's basically the life cycle. I remember that very well from your lectures. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then, and then the other part of the life cycle is, of course, if the, if the host is immunosuppressed or if it has, or if they have something like a bowel tumor, which obstructs the flow of feces through the small, through the large mm-hmm. intestine and out, mm-hmm. can delay. And then if it does delay the exit of feces, the worms can then develop to a third stage. And when they do that, of course, they're triggered to uh, penetrate the large intestine, get into the bloodstream and resume the life cycle in that sense. So, you can have that's called auto infection, and then of course, as the immune system is further depressed, let's say through uh, iatrogenics, let's say uh, through giving steroids or something like this, or through some other natural process of let's say acquiring AIDS <clears throat> virus, the um, larvae can not only uh, reproduce inside the host, they uh, to adults they increase in their numbers as well, so you become hyper infective as a result of this auto infectious stage, and that's the most dangerous form of this infection. People die from it because of the septicemia of the bacterial infection superimposed on top of this. Yeah, and I, I could go on, a, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I'll say that's a little <clears throat> clinical thing I want any of our clinicians listening who need it is that you often don't see the eosinophilia because right, if you right. have someone who's immunosuppressed, who's has the overwhelming bacterial presentation, exactly. then they become eosinopenic. And then once you treat the bacteria, then you see the eosinophil. Yeah. So eosinophils go either way. It's sort of an important thing. Exactly. All right. Are we ready to give away this book? You betcha. Yes. Well, we only have two. Well, we're going to give away all six and just randomize it. You're just going to give yeah, it to the two have, winners? Yeah, remember, not just winners. Oh. Everyone who tries. Yeah, I right? think gotta, you all right, make so six. effort. We got six but people. We'll make six. <laughs> we'll make a random okay. number. Are you ready? Random number Brr. five. Number five. Number that five. Would, that would be the second to the last person, Outstanding. which would be David P. Okay. Who, uh, David P., did Please. He a, did he get it right? Was he one of the? Yeah, strong right? ladies. Yeah. Okay. How about so, that? <laughs> a double hit. And David is the winner. Please send us, send me twip at microbe TV. Send your address. I believe you're at Tufts, David P. Oh, nice. If I remember correctly. So that's a. I don't need your phone. Just your street address, and we shall send you a autographed copy of the sixth edition of Parasitic that's Diseases. Sick. Thank you, gentlemen for your involvement in this most difficult case. Keep those letters <laughs> coming. And, uh, D- Daniel, what is it that you say when you acknowledge someone's help? And there's this whole spiel that you do, right? I oh, I do. I, and actually, they find it very entertaining. But yeah, no, thank you for involving me in the care and, um, you know, this most interesting and challenging patient. Um, I will continue to follow along in the care of this patient. <laughs> that's lovely. End, of dic- Mar- that's, end of dictation. End of dictation. That's how Mark Chrislip ends his pod, his podcast. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Minor. My yeah. My little. And then people are like, "Dad, this patient only has cellulitis." So I'm like, "Well, that's what we think right now." But you know, there could be much more. Due to what? You know, that's know. right. That's exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> All right. It's time for a paper, which is very difficult for me. <laughs> and for me. And D- Daniel, do you do you like? Are you fluent in this paper? You know, I thought this was a great paper. Okay. I thought it was really interesting. Like you read it, so I, well, I read it several times, just sort of thinking through. Like, All right, good. We'll let yeah. Daniel walk us through it. Me, <laughs> the title of this paper, it was published in Cell Reports, which is an open access journal. Should should any of you wish to follow along, you may. B1 cell, IgE, impedes mast cell-mediated enhancement of parasite expulsion through B2 IgE blockade. Ah, Okay. <laughs> Rebecca Martin and Sheila Damley are the first authors. The last author is Daniel Conrad from Virginia Commonwealth University, University of Wisconsin-Madison, University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Exactly. So before we, before Daniel walks us through that, I, I, was, I read this more than several times because— um, I hear you read it 800 times. At least, at least. And and then the terminology was uh, truncated so that it assumed a lot of knowledge on the part of the reader. And that was the trouble because it has a lot of abbreviations and a lot of uh, trouble. Jargon. The trouble is it has immunology. It has a lot of <laughs> immunology in it. So I had to do a lot of backtracking and, and literature searching. And I got to a paper which I thought was a good 
summary of where the state of the art was before this paper came out. And this is a, a 2014 paper. Daniel, would you mind if I read the abstract of this paper? Because oh. it really does summarize um, what we knew up to the point that you thought this was a fantastic article. And the name of this paper is Conditional IL-4 slash IL-13 Deficient Mice Reveal a Critical Role of Innate Immune Cells for Protective Immunity Against Gastrointestinal Helminths. Okay, go right ahead. So, um, and it's uh, written by Oser, Schwartz, and Voyeringer. So the abstract says, approximately one-third of the world's population is infected with gastrointestinal helminths. Studies in mouse models have demonstrated that cytokines interleukin IL-4 and IL-13 are essential for worm expulsion. But the critical cellular source of these cytokines is poorly defined. Here, we compared the immune response to Nipostrongylus brasiliensis in wild-type T-cell-specific IL-4, IL-13 deficient and general IL-4, IL-13 deficient mice. We show that T-cell-derived IL-4, IL-13 promoted T-cell, T-helper 2, TH2 polarization in a paracrine manner. Differentiation of alternatively activated macrophages and tissue recruitment of innate effector cells. However, innate IL-4, IL-13 played the critical role for induction of goblet cell hyperplasia and secretion of effector molecules like mucin 5AC and REL-M beta in the small intestine. Surprisingly, T-cell-specific IL-4, IL-13 deficient, and wild-type mice cleared the parasite with comparably efficiency whereas IL-4, IL-13 deficient mice showed impaired expulsion. These findings demonstrate that IL-4, IL-13 produced by cells of the innate immune system is required and sufficient to initiate effective type 2 immune responses, resulting in protective immunity against and brasiliensis. And I thought that was pretty clear. That, that, that is very clear. But it doesn't take it far enough. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to take it far enough. All right. All right, Daniel. Can All you, right. Can you walk us through this, please? And okay. We, and we will pepper you with questions. We are behind okay. you every step of the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm excited. You, usually I sort of follow along and just throw a few comments out. So this is a change of pace. The nice thing about the way Cell Reports um, does its uh, presentations is it has a, um, a, a list of highlights That's right. and an in brief. So it, it brings us sort of up to speed. So let me, um, I'll actually go ahead. And uh, so the in brief, they tell us, they say Martin et al., show that B1 cell IgE is induced during Th2 helminth infections by IL-25. This B1 cell IgE blocks parasite clearance right. through inhibition of mucosal mast cell, mast cell activation by B2 cell IgE. Um, and then we're going to go through this, but the, the highlights basically march you through what they find. So um, we're going to see that B1 cells make IgE in response to helminths. So that's their first highlight. We're actually going to see that that is affected by T cells. Uh, the second highlight they say is that IL-25 is going to induce B1 cell IgE production in, the, in these cells harvested from the helminth infected mice. We'll see only from the helminth infected mice. So there's, there's kind of a... Um, a queuing up that occurs. Now, B2 cell IgE actually enhances helminth clearance in a mast cell dependent manner. And then, boom, the B1 cell IgE actually blocks this, blocks this B2. Yin cell and yang. Why, why would you? Why would you block yeah. clearance? I don't get it. Well, because in yeah. certain allergic responses, you want to not overreact, yeah, yeah. and that's what this is a reaction to, I think. Now, Daniel, what is a B1 and a B2 cell? <laughs> yeah. Is that like a B25 or something? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a singing group, isn't it? <laughs> B52, right? <laughs> What's a B1 and B2 cell? So, okay. So, they, yeah, there there is, as you guys mentioned, there's a lot of terminology, a lot of, I guess, immunology stuff you need to know going into this that... Um, it is hard to read, I think, without that background. So the first thing, yes, what is a B1 versus a B2? Why are they numbered this way? The idea is evolutionarily, the B1 cell 
and um, ontologically. So the B1 cell evolved first, and even now when we are um, developing, the B1 cell develops first. The B2 cell came later in evolution and actually developed second um, when, a, when a mammalian embryo or an animal embryo is, is going on. So we'll talk about that. So the what, B- what about just plain old B cells? How do they relate to those? <laughs> so B, all B, well, I'll say all B cells are B1 or B2. And so there's no B3 or non-1 or 2. So the B2, the B cells that most people think about with, yeah. oh, I got a vaccination and now my B cells yeah, yeah. are making, my B cells have turned into uh, plasma, plasma cells, cells right. making antibodies. That um, is in general a B2 cell um, scenario. Okay. The B2 cells, even though they're less important, I'm going to suggest, um, They've been more well studied because it's like looking for your keys under the uh, street light. I don't know if you know that joke yeah, where yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy's out looking for his keys and you know someone's helping him and they say, "Well, are you sure you dropped them?" He goes, "Well, no, I dropped them like over there, but it's dark. I can't see, so I'm looking for them under the street light." <laughs> but the, <laughs> the the B2 cells are in the circulation; they're easier to study. So a lot of what we learn about B cells, we're actually really learning about B two cells. Um, So we'll have to go back a little. The B1 cell is a hybrid cell. It probably has macrophage phagocytic function. Um, It also makes um, antibodies, but the antibodies characteristically made by a B1 cell are selected by evolution rather than experience. So we come into the world with B1 cells making antibodies to E. coli, strep, staph, influenza, things that we're normally going to see. And it provides this initial shield before the B2 cells make specific antibodies. Mm -hmm. So they get, you know, the B2 cell is like that intern. You can't get to see him for a week, but the B1 cell is the urgent care where they're going to, you know, make sure you're still alive. These are the cells that make natural antibody, right? That's it. Exactly. A lot of it is IgM, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a lot of it is, um, but as we'll see in this paper, B1 cells can also class switch. They can produce IgE. Uh, they can IgA too, right? They can produce. They probably produce half or a lot of the IgA, um, and they also can produce IgG as well. The IgG they produce tends to be um, more polyreactive, more of a right. broad neutralizing antibody. Very interesting. Well, and now then, what? Oh. What about uh, now this IgE? Yeah. What fraction of our total serum immunoglobulins is IgE? Very small. So again, IgE, rather than being um, circulating, rather than being a high percentage of our circulating immunoglobulins, a lot of it is bound. Bound. And and it's bound particularly to mast cells. And then the mast cells are the cells that will have this ability to um, use this IgE on the surface basically as a receptor. So think of it as, I guess, like a fork, you know, and the part you hold is sticking into the mast cell. The part that's sticking out is the one that can recognize certain antigens Mm. and basically acts as Mm. a receptor for the mast cell to recognize um, that this antigen is there, this foreign thing is there, and then the mast cell can respond using the IgE. But as we're seeing... What the B1 cells are doing is it's blocking those mast cells from having this response. Daniel, is your boat called mast cell? <laughs> it does have a mast. <laughs> I would think you would call it mast cell if you, because you seem to like these cells. <laughs> the, you know, this this stuff I have to admit is fascinating. You, know, you go back to the concept of the B1 cell, and you know, not only. Do we have them? Do mice have them? Oh, it goes back to sharks. I mean, this is yeah, an early yeah. evolutionary thing. Cool. And it makes a lot of sense, right? Why wait till you get exposed to something if your species can have a, an evolutionary memory of what's been seen in the past? Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, it's brought back other- lots of memories, by the way. <laughs> you know, during the evolution of thinking about how helmets are expelled from hosts, because they are, the mechanism yeah. is complicated, and it doesn't involve direct contact with antibodies and antigens necessarily. In this case, as we're about to see, I don't want to spoil it, rather spoiler alert, <clears throat> but it involves the degranulation of mast cells. The, 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 the parasite here is a nematode. It right? is. I was told it's nematode, by the way, by, by a Brit. Fine. Um, <laughs> and yeah, what do they know? <laughs> this, How did he tell you to spell hematology? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these are mouse versions of 
Hookworm. Hookworms. That's correct. Nipple Both. strongulus and hel- heligmosigmoides. H. H polygyrus. That's um, what he's where do they uh, inhabit in the mouse? The gut? They're the in gut the small, tract? small intestine. They don't no. circulate, right? No. Well, they do the, to complete the life cycle. In the just blood, like though, the not, the, not in the blood. They do, do just they? like the hookworm life cycle, just like the strongyloides, yeah. too. They, they, they penetrate the skin. They migrate through the body. They end mm. up in the small intestine, and that's where they take up residence. And that's why they're such a good lookalike for hookworm. So IgE is... Is targeting them in the gut, but there is a phase well, in the blood. Is there a blood phase that's targeted by IgE or IgM or IgG or anything? It's targeted not in the blood, but in the skin as they start to penetrate as you get exposed. Uh, again, so there's again, no reaction again. in the blood to these guys? Not usually. In gals. Okay. Not usually. Got it. I mean, I would say the important thing for this is, well, um, for instance, the Heligmosomoides. <laughs> Very um, good, Daniel. That's <laughs> excellent. <laughs> oh, well, since I'm leading it, I think I've pronounced things right today. But don't worry, I'll go back to mispronouncing in the future. Um, the nice thing about um, that particular organism is it's a great model for chronic intestinal um, helminth infections. And so they use that in, in rat models to study this. And it's... Uh, Lord knows the human condition is riddled with chronic helminthic infections of the gut tract. So these things really do relate to everyday life. Daniel, yeah. tell me one other thing. What's weep, yes. what's weep and sweep? <laughs> weep, weep and sweep. Tell me where this is. It's in the introduction. It's in the introduction of the paper. Let's see where we are. It says here, weep. wild-type mice are able to clear these infections in a T-cell-dependent manner, relying on IL-13 and 4 for the weep and sweep of intestinal Helminth clearance. Yeah, this is the disconnect between direct contact of antibody and the host, and the yeah. parasite, rather. You see there, they actually defines what weep and sweep is. Yeah, and it's a mucus secretion. That, so you uh, basically increase mucus, glo- goblet cell hyperplasia, because they're yes, making mucus. that's right. That's and enteric right. nerve stimulation to contract the gut and shove the worms out. That's weep and sweep it out. That's just great. That's the title of our show. <laughs> weep and sweep. I actually like that. That's Isn't that, that great? Is stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that is good stuff. That's right. Uh, so I, I am used to viruses coursing through the bloodstream or in mucosal layers, but they're always bound by antibodies or t- attacked by cells. This is very different. Do you remember when we had Daniel? Uh, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> we had Daniel once on our show. <laughs> no, 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 no. no uh, Dr. Boothroyd. I'm blocking on his John first John Boothroyd. John Boothroyd. And he talked about kiss and spit. Yeah, he did. So here we have sweep and weep, and we have kiss and spit. spit. Yes. <laughs> All right. Very good. Love yeah. it. It is exciting. Sorry, John, I forgot your name. Now that it's explained to me, yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, very I didn't realize okay. that these B ones were ancient. Holy crap! Yeah, they. You know, they were the first, the primordial B cell, and they, um, and very they good. still, even, even in, um, you know, some at least I'll say some of my publications on human B one cells suggesting that they also have phagocytic function. Okay. Um, in humans, that's wow. amazing. But that's that's amazing. And they're not bone marrow wild. derived, or they are bone marrow derived. So, that, so that's an interesting thing in their development. They develop initially in the fetal liver uh, ah, before okay. we're before we're born. But okay. then, after we're born, you can actually, at least, has been shown in the mouse, um, there are bone marrow derived B one cells, but they're different than the fetal liver derived. And the fetal liver derived ones, they can last for the life of the organism. Good heavens. Which is very different, right? I mean, I, I joke with the residents about everyone knows the life, you know, the how long a red cell lasts for, but what's the lifespan of a, of a white cell? And then I go through each one because I claim that's what really matters. <laughs> but this is interesting, right? I mean, these B1 cells can be derived in the fetal liver and then they can actually last. Um, wow. And, you know, and of course, that's what I claim. That's why we die is we lose our B1 cells. Um, if we can only keep them, we'd live forever. Do we have, uh, really? do they make memory cells, Daniel? <laughs> Um, that has been shown. There's a group in Stanford, they uh, do? Hertzenberg, and uh, they were actually able to show that B1 cells can develop memory. Okay. And so you can actually develop a B1 cell memory, which is interesting. So now they're, you know, they're moving a little past the just evolutionary memory. They, to some degree, can have a little bit of an experiential memory. Good. All right. Okay. Onwards. Onwards. So the, the first thing they, they show us is that actually there is um, – uh, an interaction. There's actually T cell help um, as far as the B1 cell IgE production. This is IgE against the helminth, right? Yes, and it, it's a you know they use this. Um, I always hate when people use acronyms, but they use MC in here, and you'll see that that always stands for mast cells as we go mm-hmm. forward. So these um, would these IBM would these IG, <laughs> IBMs these IgEs <laughs> would they bind the helminth? Yes. 
No. So they, no. They, no. they would not bind with high affinity. I think that's important. B2 cells can make high affinity yeah, immunoglobulins. That that's are an acquired targeted. immune response, right? This yeah, is an innate yeah. immune response. But they bind a little. Yes, yeah, so they're they're broadly um, reactive, and they are, we'll say, sticky, right? They have the ability to, when you pump out a bunch of them, some of them will actually bind helmets, but not with a high affinity. And so that binding to the helmet, what, does it have any consequence? None. Um, no, not as far as this goes, no. The consequence is going to be the interference with the B2. Okay, it, it binds to the mast cells. Exactly. Yes. Okay, so the, the B1 antibody doesn't have to be very specific as long as it can bind the it's mast got, cell. They all have the same FC receptor, correct? Yeah, but the, the other part, you know, the FAB. Ah, that's the part. What is that? It must be against the helmet, but it's weakly binding, right? I don't know. You just said it was weakly binding. He did. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It right. plays no role in immunity Sorry. to the helmet. Let's put all right, it that go way. ahead, Daniel. I'll try not to interrupt. Well, that's, no, that's actually an interesting sort of people visualizing. And we'll, we'll get to this. How does the B1 cell antibody interfere? Um, but the next the next figure, they basically are reiterating this issue that the B1 cell antibody, it's nonspecific. Mm-hmm. Um, a B2 cell, when you showed a specific antigen, will make high affinity antibodies to that. Through B1 like- cells. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the whole germinal center, clonal selection, right. all that great stuff. And the B1 cells just react and start pumping out lots of nonspecific um, B1 cell. Right. Um, and the idea immunos. is that to bind mast cells. Yes. And they're going to do what when this antibody binds? Okay. We're going to well, find when out. We get, yeah, when we actually right, get um, to that, we're going to move to the next figure. And basically, this stuff's pretty complicated. I'll give you that. Um, but they're going to they're going to show that this antibody produced by the B1 cells is actually going to block the antigen specific IgE mast cell degranulation. So it's going to block the degranulation that the B2 cell IgE um, mm-hmm. is producing. So Daniel. Uh, this, yes, I, I hate to keep interrupting you, but this is this is the most exciting part for me. Is that what actually is the mechanism for degranulating a mast cell? And what does that, what so, does that mean? What does that mean? Degranulate. Yeah. Explain what yeah. degranulation is. No, this is this is a good thing. Um, when you have, uh, so we'll, we'll go to like thinking about a cell that has um, receptors on the surface. And when those receptors bind to something and congregate, they can trigger a release of preformed um, mediators that are in granules, right? So you, you see a neutrophil, it's got all these little granules that can myeloperoxidase, for instance. That's mm-hmm. what makes uh, that's what makes our snot green, our sea snot green, or seal snot green, I guess. <laughs> seal snot, yeah. <laughs> right? And so right. these are... So these are granules, and you can actually have a release. Now, the mast cell has receptors on its surface that bind to, or saying, like the handle part of the fork, so the handle part of the, the immunoglobulins, yeah, yeah. so the, the um, FC portion of the immunoglobulins. And when you have a bunch of those, and it binds to something, and they come together, it causes a release of these mediators. And the whole idea is it's binding to the target. It's releasing a, a site-directed um, granules to that target, which is sitting right in front of it, bound at this small distance away. Which in this case is a helminth, right? Exactly. So I just want to be yeah. clear about this and see if I've got this right, because if B1 cells make IgE and B2 cells make IgE, mm-hmm. they both bind equally well to a mast cell. So that, that's the interesting thing. And if you think about, and I like people now, we can get the visual here. Think of your mast cell, and it's got these FC receptors, which can be filled with any um, any immunoglobulins. They can either be high affinity ones that will bind and cause a response to a helminth, or they can be saturated with nonspecific ones that will not bind well, will not have enough affinity to cause this uh, coalescence of receptors and the degranulation response. So that's the point I want to raise now. You need an antigen hmm. that's specific for the FAB fragments hmm. from IgE in order to get these to aggregate. They mm-hmm. won't aggregate without that. So the helminth yeah. antigen actually does that by bridging two IgE molecules. that's what molecules. degranulates, right? Yes. And that and when that happens, there's a signal transduction that causes yeah, it to go cascade, right? So what, what's so, in these granules? What kind of factors? Uh, ha. Do they do they kill the helmet or no, just sweep they, it they, out? They they cause the differentiation of goblet cells. Oh, they make that. mucus, sweep and weep, right. Yeah. They, they hyper uh, 
proliferate. They must also have cytokines that do things. They're in the well. they're in the crypts and the uh, yeah. the, the crypts. Then when you see a, a helicobacter polygyrus infection, and you follow the development of just the there's just the goblet cells. Don't look at the mast cells or anything else. Just look at the number of goblet cells. They're easy to stain. Yeah. And you just do this over time. Eventually, the, almost every other gut cell is a goblet, a goblet cell. cell. Yeah, there's a picture here. It's in incredible. And that's that's not weeping. That's uh, oh, that's sobbing <laughs> with, a, yeah. with a large S. All of that biologically active material uh, dislodges the parasite and away it goes. Right? That's really remarkable. That's fantastic. Yeah. But that, that only happens after degranulation of the mast cells. Yeah, of course. And and and, and that you, only happens when you bridge two IgE molecules with the antigen of choice. Now, this is not something you could do in your lung, I presume, because you would have problems. You get By the way, the same mechanism seems to apply to influenza infection. It actually mentioned that in the article. I guess you could sweep up the mucus by ciliary action, yeah, yeah. right? The more mucus you get, the less. Ah, interesting. Sure, of course. Now, why IgE? So IgEs are only the only ones that will hit mass cells? Well, they're called homocytotropic antibody for that reason, because they stick to cells, right, of various kinds, but in yeah. particular mast cells. And basophils, those are, those are circulating mast cells, basically. The basophil is a circulating mm. mast cell. Now, Daniel, if you ha- when you have allergies, do you have does, do the IgEs bind the allergen, and then that de- degranulates, and that's part of the allergic response? That is that, and that's probably a good way for people to think about this: that's is that the best these way. mast cells are in, um, I'll say, mucosal, you know, mucosal surfaces, mucosal mm-hmm. environments. So not only are they in the intestine, but there are mast cells in the lungs as well, and this mm-hmm. could be a problem, right? You've got the specific B2 cell derived IgE, and then the hmm. allergen, pollen, grass, whatever it is, you know, which you ideally would not be having such an exuberant degranulation response to, you're getting that. And then you're getting the wheezing, you're getting the diarrhea, you're getting um, the runny eyes, all these other symptoms. What about during some bacterial infections like uh, whooping cough, for instance? Um, d- different, actually. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's say the the pertussis, you know, the, or the hundred day cough is gonna is gonna, um, yeah. It, because okay. if you think about the time course of the IgE development, but so so here we have as we just were, we've got these picture these mast cells, and they've got these granules with all kinds of basically mediators for vasodilation and secre- secretory pathways, as well as um, hydrolases and things that are just toxic for the um, helminth or, you know, whatever they're trying to target. Um, But the interesting thing we're seeing here is instead of necessarily always getting a full-blown response, if you can fill some of those FC receptors with B1 cell (laughs) IgE, you attenuate Mm -hmm. to some degree. And, you know, maybe we're already sort of getting into why this is a good... um, It's a competitive inhibition. Yeah, why this is good, you know, it would be nice, right, instead of every time you go out on a day with lots of pollen, if you had enough B1 cell IgE, um, keeping your mast cells from degranulating all the time. Yeah. Because so they have lower affinity for the end, for the allergen, yeah. right? So yeah. So they run the saber-toothed tiger that's tracing. Very chasing. interesting. Very interesting <laughs> strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so as they show, you've got this I-25 production by our intestinal tough cells. I know tough cells are a favorite of Dixon's. <laughs> really? Um, we had a show on it. Yeah, we, we did. Did they go to that. Tufts? They did. <laughs> they, they did. <laughs> you know, and they're involved in this IL-25 release. And um, So let's see where we go next. So here, here we've shown all this... Um, and then they um, they show actually cytokine basically IL five is enhancing this IgE production by B one cells right so mm-hmm. that's all good, right. um, and then we're back to our IL twenty five and this is going to enhance our B one cell production but only this was that interesting distinction only from mice that have been infected by helminths exactly. so it takes the helminth infection to prime. Um, that's them for this. Find. That's a fantastic finding because phosphorylcholine is one of those uh, substances that actually primes B1 expansion. Mm-hmm. And a number of helminths actually secrete that molecule. Huh. So they disarm the immune system, get, giving them time to survive in the host long enough to reproduce. Yeah, and that out. was actually a part of the discussion of this paper. That That is an amazing mm-hmm. connection. Mm-hmm. They got to get out. They have to get in, then they have to get out quickly. Exactly right. <laughs> or, or quick enough, at least. Quick enough, yeah. That's right. Wow. 
Yeah, and this is one of those interesting things. And I think this, you know, people who studied no biotic animals, I think we have someone on the show who did that. We do. Is that when you are studying B1 cells in a, in a mouse, for instance, where you get your mouse and the amount of exposures and how sort of clean or dirty the environment is, which pathogens they might be or non-pathogenic mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. microbes they get exposed to can influence um, B1 cell um, activity. And, right. uh, and we're seeing that here. So, right. um, hmm. Neat. All right. Who makes the IL-25, by the way? Ah. Do we know? So. I believe it's from um, T cells, but let me just see if okay. we know that for sure. Yeah. Um, so let's see where we where we are. So we've we've got the IL twenty five, the B one cell, the IgE. The we know that the B two cell clearance is mast cell um, and IgE dependent. Right. And I think we're we're almost at our exciting conclusion. Let's see. Right. And I think I think that is our our exciting conclusion for bringing yeah. this all together. So um, Finkelman and Urban are two authors on this paper, and those guys have been around a long time, and I've heard them talk at various meetings, and they're good, and they they really are thorough in in the way they look at this, and this is a lifetime's work for these people. It's amazing to actually come up with the uh, all of the steps of the mechanism, not only to expel worms, but also the way the worms disarm the immune system to last long enough so they can reproduce, and it all involves these uh, B one and B two cells. All right, here's the question. Is yeah. this happen in people <laughs> with hookworms? You know, Vincent. because you know, as you know, mice are not humans. We do know this, and well, they have worms. different lymphokine or <laughs> lymphos- cytokine responses. Could you get some clinical data from people to support this idea of these B one, B two IgEs and yeah. helping or hindering? Yeah. I did want to say one more thing, yeah. by the way, because they did mention other worms too. They mentioned schistosomes and they mentioned trichinella. So trichinella infection in a first infection goes through this routine. IgE business, yeah. Yeah, and all that stuff, and then the goblet cells and everything else. But mm-hmm. what about a second infection? Now, a second infection, this is called slow expulsion or just normal rate of expulsion, okay? The second time a host sees the trichinella infection, they don't expel those worms at the same rate as they do the first expulsion. In fact, the worms don't even get a chance to penetrate the gut tract and start developing into adults. They get mm-hmm. expelled as infectious larvae. Mm-hmm. It's called rapid expulsion, and it, it, it's an explosive diarrheal response that's triggered by the fact that the antigens are just sitting there waiting for something to happen, right? Yep. And the antibodies are fixed in the tissues. Along comes more antigen, and bam, out the worms go. Mm-hmm. Now, who benefits from that? Well, the worms do, right? Yes, because the host is already infected with that parasite. Yeah, so why should move the, on. And what happens is that they get passed into the barnyard, let's say, or into the yeah, environment. Yeah. And there are lots of, excuse the expression, everybody, uh, I'll, I'll use the polite term, coprophages. Yep. <laughs> Animals out there that go along and pick up a free meal. Yeah. They look at it as a meal, and they become infected. It's the, the raccoon so, latrine, right? Exactly. So <laughs> raccoon. Uh, so rapid expulsion actually favors yeah. the the further spread of the same parasite. So l- listen to this last. It's a different mechanism. This last paragraph is beautiful. Yeah. IgE has long been known to be induced during Helminth infections, but its role in immunity is often debated to parasites. We hypothesize that in the long evolutionary interaction between Helminths and mammals, Helminths have developed a mechanism of inducing large amount of B1 cell IgE that may provide it an evolutionary. Exactly. Survival advantage. Exactly. Slower clearance and increased fecundity leads, leads to increased egg pow- output. I think they showed in this paper that there's some effect on fecundity there is, yeah. of B1 yeah. IgE yeah. as and, well. And in trichinella, it's the live larvae that are... In summary, this study produced. provides evidence for two opposing roles of IgE. Right. Isn't that cool? It is. It's very nice. Well, I, I, I would yeah. think that they should modify that last sentence because it, it says that if the IG is nonspecific, it can block. But if it's specific, it enhances. That's the actually the way that should read, I think. Because nonspecific yeah. IgE on the surface of a mast cell, you can't make a bridge between two Ig molecules with an antigen because it's so polyspecific that the chances are for that antigen to come by is, is almost zero. Whereas if it's the, the IgE produced by the B2 cells, which is specific for the, that's a, yeah. and then you can easily bridge it and you can easily get the granulation. All right, so Daniel, could you? <clears throat> Would you agree with that, Daniel? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I have to say, like, I agree with you, Vince. This last paragraph is great. And it just, you know, it just makes you think, like, uh, I probably won't sleep tonight because just all the ideas you think <laughs> about here. And, you know, it is this idea that there's really two types of IgE. There's B1 and B2. Mm, yeah. And the B2 is responsible for parasite expulsion, helminth expulsion, but it also is responsible for all these allergic sure, uh, and absolutely. immune un regulated issues that we sort of first world problems yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and the b1 cell ige is the stuff that's trying to keep this in line but as we saw without the helmet exposure you don't have the same responsiveness of b1 cells so right. you're you know this gets back to some of this um hygiene hypothesis idea where yeah, we don't want yeah. you to be filthy but we um our immune system evolved with helmets around Correct. and b1 cells hmm. work better um, if I can say that, with <laughs> some helminth exposure. Yeah. And it's tough. Here we are. We've gotten rid of all the helminths, you know, even so much as get a little pinworm and we're like throwing a fit and, and buying expensive medicines to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> but now the B1 cells um, are having their, they're having trouble making all this regulatory IgE without that exposure. All right. So now tie in allergies with worms. With these kind of guys, how, how does- yeah, yeah. So when you have too many um, of the B two cell, B two cell derived high affinity IgE bound to your mast cells, they're going to be hyper reactive. Mm-hmm. If you can actually um, increase the number of B one cell IgE. Ah, okay. Um, you're going to have less responsive mast cells. They're basically not going to throw a fit every time the pollen count goes up. All right. All right. All right. So, but here in this, country, <laughs> in this country, we're all, as you said, we're all free of these helmets pretty much, right? I'm heading to Panama Saturday, so I'll be <laughs> <involved>. yeah. <laughs> You might have been infected already, not no, Daniel? <laughs> exactly. All right. That's great. Nice summary, Daniel. Perfect. Very good. Perfect. Very good. Yeah. Now I really get it, and it's really cool. Makes me want to go read some immunology. Papers. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. I'm serious. Dixon, you have a hero? I do. Last week, we did Bill... Or last time, I we should say. Bill we, did, we did Bill Hearts. But we, we're going through the Bs because we're going to do this alphabetically. You know, you don't have any women in that book. You ought to fix it. In the so next sue me. <laughs> so sue me. And I'm not going to sue you, but you should be cognizant. I didn't mean that literally, by the way. Because we did have a, a woman suggested. No, but we did have like a, that, a woman hero. I know, but there's none in the book. That's what I'm saying. I want you to, I know you print this thing over and over, so why don't you fix Just, it? Put some women in. We need some blank pages for that to happen. That's how we did this one. Okay, so this this hero is David Bruce. Oh, I know that name. You sure do. He's an he MD. Was in, he was in Cream, the rock band. That's right. Oh, that was... Uh, yeah, that was different, Bruce. That was Jack Baker. Are we going to go on like this? You want a serious discussion about this? <laughs> Brucey I. That's right. Go ahead. Among other things, or brucellosis. You really... Same don't, guy. You don't like any joking around? At no, all? but I was in the process of... <laughs> I'm sorry, so sir. So serious. <laughs> you accuse me of not having women in here. This guy was, you know... One Bruce, of our... Brucellosis, too? Yeah. Wow. Named after him, too. So the, he's an MD... His dates are 1855 to 1931, so he's a contemporary of a lot of people out there. Bruce described the bacteria responsible for causing disease in cattle, Brucella melatensis, melatensis, sorry. Melatonensis. Melatonensis. Mm. You know, you got me on that one, Daniel. <laughs> Brucella melatonensis, and correctly identified both the vector, tsetse fly, and the protozoan parasite it transmits to cattle, Nagana as a trypanosome, later named after him, Trypanosoma brucei. His discovery soon led to the identification of two other trypanosomes, Trypanosoma brucei gambiansi and Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiansi, as the causative agents of African sleeping sickness in humans. He was a persistent parasitologist. He began on the, I believe it was the Isle of... Um, Either Malta or Crete, and I, I'm blocking on this. Daniel, can you help me out on that? Where he looked at uh, brucellosis first, and then uh, traveled on to Africa and uh, got involved in lots of other diseases, and including the trypanosomes. Mm. Uh, world famous, uh, very intense investigator with uh, a good head on his shoulders. Highly respected. Thank you, Dixon de Pommier. You're welcome, Vincent. And now. It's time for a new case study. Indeed. 
All right. Stump you guys, the stars. Everybody ready? <laughs> We're ready. Right. So this is this is another one of those where we will have a guest on our next show to do the unveil. Cool. Not a penguin, is it? Well, <laughs> Right. I'm not going to say. <laughs> That's right. How would he? I can't give it away right like last that. Time, last time it was a penguin. Well, that we had a guest on. You know, was that? I know we, we had African sleeping sickness one time with a guest. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, that by, we, the, the last yeah. guest we had was Paul Kelly. Yeah. And he did. Uh, oh, and yes, I actually saw Paul last week. I, I'm doing some. Um, some avian malaria project and uh, lemur iron overload studies. So cool. um, Paul was doing well. It's good wow. to see him. Okay. History of present illness. We have a female teenager. She is living in New York City. She has previously been in good health and she presents with a rash for two weeks and this abnormal feeling in her legs. Uh, she reports that initially she felt like she had an upper respiratory infection that started in early January with some congestion but no cough. She didn't have any trouble breathing, no fever. Uh, the the rash, um, there's no vesicles. It's sort of a patchy rash. It was initially on the stomach but then spread to the chest or back, upper thighs, groin area. It was not on her palms and soles. She said it was really itchy, worse at night. Um, but that bothered the patient less then um, this feeling of pins and needles and sharp stabbing in her feet and legs. So she goes to the emergency department. Um, she's, she's told that uh, this is probably zoster and she's started on gabapentin. Okay. A couple days later, she's having fevers. Fevers as high as 101, some urinary hesitancy, dizziness. She's feeling lightheaded. Um, the pain is overall getting worse, like this, this sharp stabbing, pins and needles. So she is seen in the outpatient setting by a neurologist and an infectious disease physician, and it's recommended that she be admitted for inpatient evaluation. Okay. As we mentioned, no past medical, no past surgical history, um, a few family history things. She has uh, type 1 diabetes in, in one um, aunt. Uh, her father has migraines. Um, no autoimmune diseases are noted. She's taking the gabapentin as well as ibuprofen and Tylenol as needed. Doesn't report being allergic to any um, medications. Immunizations are reported to be all up to date, um, including, interesting enough, she was vaccinated for varicella, right? So she didn't have natural exposure. That's sort of an interesting, maybe people have comments on the shingles diagnosis given that information. Hmm. All right. And some social history, right? As mentioned, um, this young lady lives in New York City with her parents and a younger brother. Uh, they have a dog and a lizard. Um, there's a bunch of travel, right? Travel to Florida, Tennessee, Vermont, Massachusetts, um, and actually um, Holland a few years ago. The family had recently taken a vacation to the big island of Hawaii where they had been from uh, 1231 and they got back on the 6th of January. When they were there, they stayed at an Airbnb and then a hotel, um, snorkeling, surfing. Um, they... Uh, as far as diet, this was asked about. She um, she had a few bites of sushi, not a huge fan. And there was also a history of a salad that she ate, but that no one else ate. Um, okay, no other toxic habits, anything we find out about. And I'm going to give you guys the physical, okay? Um, when she's seen, she, as mentioned, she's febrile. Um, heart rate is accelerated. It's greater than 110. Blood pressure is okay. Um, saturation is fine. Um, she, she's uncomfortable and she doesn't seem to really want to move, um, because of this pain issue. Um, most exam is unremarkable, except I'll get to the neurological exam. Um, they, she's actually moving all her extremities, but she's moving them somewhat slowly because of this concern with pain. Um, sensation is intact throughout, um, Let's see, skin, there's this rash, as, as we mentioned, it's this irregular macular blotchy rash. Um, it's on the chest, the neck, the back, and the abdomen. And we're going to give people um, some labs here. So she's got a white count, which is in the normal range, 9.2. And the distribution is not much of a shift. Neutrophil 68, lymphocytes 20, um, eosinophils 3. I'll give you guys that. Um, 
her sedimentation rate is slightly increased at 24. I mean, normal is up to about 15 or 20. Okay. And then, because they're concerned, she has a lumbar puncture. And the lumbar puncture, right, so they're looking at cerebral spinal fluid. There's increased white cells, 280, and 32% of these are eosinophils. There's no red blood cells. The protein's a little bit elevated. The glucose is unremarkable. All right. Dixon's and got I think, it already. No, he doesn't. He just thinks he knows. That's And all. I think that's all I'm giving. <laughs> a lot. That is a lot. It's a lot of information. So next time it'll be in, um, when we record next, it'll be two weeks from probably the time of the release. Um, we're going to actually have someone on who's going to talk to us about this case. Um, what I will do is a bit of follow-up. Um, yesterday, actually, this this young lady was readmitted to the hospital. So we're going to get even, even more. We'll get a little more information on the case. Um, but hopefully this... Um, People can put together this bit of information and have a sense of, of what we need to be doing, what we should be thinking about. Um, we could talk a little bit about what potential diagnostic tests are, are available um, with what we might be considering here. And Dixon, I don't know, did you have any more questions for us before we throw this out to the crowd? Nope. He's good. Okay. Okay. Is you can ask, uh, uh, ask about toxic habits, Vincent? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you already said it. She has none. No toxic <laughs> habits? No boyfriend or girlfriend? No sex at the moment? No. no. Okay. No drugs, right? No drugs. No. no. And, and she doesn't even listen to rock and roll. It's right. unfortunate. Do we have time for a snippet? Or are we bound and Yeah, you could do a snippet. To go ahead. to the uh, What do you got? Letters. No, we, we'll just skip letters. It's fine. Okay, it's we'll late. do those next time. This, this appeared in this week's Science Magazine, February 23rd. 2018, volume 359, issue 6378, page 853. Title of this snippet is Worms Living in Your Veins? 17 volunteers say, okay. And then the subtitle is A controversial study infects people with schistosomiasis to speed up drug and vaccine development. Wow. And this is a human experiment being done in Leiden, the Netherlands, um, with full permission of the university. Um, and what they're trying to show, of course, is that a few parasites, not a lot of parasites, in this case, each one is getting 20 worms altogether. IV? No, you don't have to give this IV at all. You just let them crawl through your skin. People are letting you put them on their skin? They are. How long does it take for them to burrow? Mm, about 20 minutes, maybe less. Oh they they seat their hair shaft and down they go. You feel you know, this as this is happening? You do. There's an itching sensation because they secrete proteases along the way. <laughs> How much but usually they- only a second infection, I should say. The initial time you don't feel much, but a yeah. second when you've been well, immunologically primed is when you can develop a... I must tell you that itch. a lot of them complained about a little itch as to where... Maybe the, that might have been psychosomatic because they knew what was happening. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fortunate part of this study is that there is a, uh, a very good drug called prosequential, mm. and... Um, and there's no hope in the future for a vaccine in people unless they start exploring roots of infection. And this is the root of infection that if with repeated infections, the skin develops a barrier. Uh, and and again, it's it's related to the eosinophil story that we just covered and the breakdown of mast cells, et cetera. But in this case, the IgE actually attacks the schistosomula in the skin mm-hmm. along with the eosinophils and kills them because they – the eosinophils secrete lots of different... Uh, is it B1 or B2? It's a B2. These are yeah, B2s. right. These are definitely be B2s. Now, what's the purpose? So they, they put so these they, on, and what are they going to do with them? Well, they're going to measure their immune responses to all kinds of uh, antigens see. that they've got, and they're, they're going to terminate the infection. But they they had a, um, a reviewer of this um, approach, Dan Colley. He was a friend of mine and uh, works at the University of uh, Georgia in Athens. And uh, I'll give you the quote... Uh, it says, but but uh, let's see, uh, let's see. It's uh, I can pick up the sentence and says uh, there is no schistosomiasis vaccine, and and the only one old inadequate drug, prosequential, to treat it. Infecting humans could help speed up the development of new interventions. 
Rostenberg, who was the principal investigator in this study, has designed the experiment to prevent the parasites from reproducing, that is, by terminating them before they actually start to produce eggs. And she says the risk to volunteers is extremely low. That was her opinion. However, the next sentence goes on to say, but not low enough, some scientists argue, because there is no guarantee that subjects will get rid of their parasites when the study is over. Quotes, I would not volunteer for this study, and if I had a son or daughter who wanted to volunteer, I would recommend against it, said Daniel Colley, a schistosomiasis researcher at the University of mm-hmm. Georgia in, in Athens. And um, there's a lot of other nuance to this uh, snippet, but uh, just know that doctors have been famous for infecting themselves with yeah, things. Yeah, and there's a wonderful book called The Guinea Pig Doctors that was produced by mm. <laughs> two Baltimore Sun reporters. And I have that book, and it's filled with all kinds of um, right. good stories, and some of them were terrible outcomes. Of. What is the worst thing that could happen here? Here? Oh, well, the worms could reproduce and produce eggs. And then... Uh, Paralysis. With, with no, no, with these the, the twenty <laughs> altogether, ten adult female worms producing eggs. I don't think so. Mm. That that's an apparent infection in most cases. And in fact, all cases. If you had ten parasites, that's not going to cause any Daniel, overt. You, you are effect. less sanguine. Wait about a minute, Daniel. Yeah, so I, Daniel went so swimming in Lake Victoria. Sing- <laughs> so I would. So and this is actually the problem. If you get a single, um, so we talk about japonicum, which has an affinity for the CNS. Yeah, that's that's but, different. But even um, just as so Mansoni, and, and there was this, this was a court case in New York where there was a group yeah, no, that went to Victoria, and they were told, you know, don't swim in rivers. But the person obviously hadn't mentioned a lake, which, uh, and then the person had what was. You know, probably a well. Who knows how heavy the infection was? But they actually had an egg, and they were paralyzed that's right. um, from the waist down for the rest of their life. Yeah. And so, and that's the you know, is it a low risk? Yeah, but being you know being paralyzed is permanent. So, so that's you know, it's tough if you said, okay, we're going to give you this thing and we're going to treat you, and there is a chance you could be paralyzed. You know, that's kind of yeah, they tough. It. I wonder e- if they're paying e- them a lot. Each person was paid a thousand euro. It's not worth it. <laughs> that's a lot of money and that's where you sort of wonder the ethics of because for a lot of people that's a lot of money and no this is the big issue this is the big risk issue. paralysis so that's why they uh, published this story it's very interesting <clears throat> so i thought it was worthy of bringing it up yeah, but i'm sure we're going to get a lot of write-ins to tell us whether they think this is a good idea or not tell us what you think folks is this a good idea we will would be happy to read idea it. or would you do it exactly dixon would you do this for a thousand euros, I would forget the money. Would I just do it or not? That's the point. Um, you could do it now because you you know you don't have nothing to lose anymore. You think? <laughs> you think the ones would die? I'm so old that they. Was, I want. I don't want that host. I'm sorry. But on the other hand, you like traveling, so you don't want to be. <laughs> I do like traveling. paralyzed. It's uh, you know Dan Colley is a a good friend of mine. He's I've never known him to be a conservative person. Uh, he has a broad view of of biology mm. and of. of he said it's not worth it. That's what he said. Daniel, would you do this? I don't think so. so. Yeah, so I would. Um, but I, <laughs> but, you would. But I say that because I'm the kind of person, Dixon's the kind of, you know, I, I don't think people can really give informed consent unless they really understand the issue and the risk. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is one of the things. I travel these areas. I, as Dixon points out, I swim in Lake Malawi and things. And so I, I am willing to take certain risks. Um, yes, you are. If I feel like it's going to make a difference, if yeah. it's going to be part of um, connecting the people in a local community or it's going to be part of advancing the science or, yeah. there are certain risks that i think i'm willing to take and um yeah right there was a group at nih for instance about i don't know this might be 20 years ago now tom nutman was part of that study and they infected themselves with hookworm larvae you'd say well, that's pretty harmless and there was only they only got about 10 larvae or 20 larvae or something like this and what they all wanted to find out was when the worm actually com- completed its mm-hmm. life cycle mm-hmm. and then they took blood almost every day from everybody to measure the cytokine responses okay it seems easy enough but what if this parasite also transmits a virus of unknown origin and it emerges all of a sudden and you sure. get sick from it yeah and now you say well what the heck did that I don't, you know so there are yeah. there are these caveats that you have Always. to take care of and that nice. book, uh, Paris, um, a guinea pig doctors goes through each one of these in d- great detail. <laughs> so when was, that, a good uh, re- when was that written? Oh, quite a while ago. But if you went online, I'm sure you could find the title of it. The guinea pig doctors. And, uh, right. I was intrigued by the title. We'll look at, I'll look it up, put it in the show notes. Great. 
Thank you, Dixon. Welcome. That's TWIP148. You can find it at microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you listen on your cell phone or tablet, please subscribe in your podcast player. We like to get your subscriptions. And if you really like what we do, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. There are ways that you can help us financially. You can send your case guesses, your email to twip at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Medical Center, where amazing things are happening. <laughs> Parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, my pleasure, as always. Dixon de Pommier is at thelivingriver.org. It's a very cool site. And parasiteswithoutborder.com. And he has a whole host of websites, but we'll, we'll keep it at those. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASM and Ronald Jenkins for his introductory music and closing music, ronaldjenkins.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. <laughs> too fast, Dixon. Oh, not fast enough. Let's try this one more time, and then you can record it. Another twip it is parasitic. <laughs> try it one more time. Come on. What? Just normal rate of speech. D- D- Daniel normal. is behind us. I know that, but I can't help that. He's just, you know. I'm on. just going to do it. You guys have to match my. Uh, I, match we have to match him. Voice. We do? Yeah, do it once. Do just give us a cue. Another, okay. another twip. Another twip is parasitic. That's too slow. You didn't do it. No, and I was waiting to hear his cue. I was going to take it for the next one. That's too slow. That's too slow. All right. Another twip is parasitic. That's good. Okay. Try that again. Another twip is Is parasitic. I think we did that. That Parasitic. Okay. All right. (laughs)